Hi, welcome to the second video in our week one of Psych 2335 Statistics for Professional Practice. Today we're taking up two of the most familiar topics in statistics, tables and graphs. Most people think that they know almost everything there is to know about tables and graphs because we see them all the time and we think we've understood all the information in them. Part of what you'll see in today's video and in the textbook modules that go with it is just how much detail and accuracy go into making a good table and how often mistakes creep by and cause problems that we don't even realize are happening. So I encourage you in this uh, set of videos and also especially in the problems that you'll be solving to pay attention to the concepts and begin to be a master of tables and graphs. Let's go. A frequency table shows us a score and then the number of people who had that score. It's a way of collapsing a large data set into a smaller one. For something like this, where the scores ranged from 56 to 98, we didn't get all that much collapse because we have to have a row even when nobody actually got a particular score. As we'll see later, the grouped frequency table helps us in situations like this. In a cumulative frequency distribution, two things have happened. First, we've eliminated the lines where nobody had the score, so all of the frequencies are 1 or above. There are no zeros. But the most important thing that's happened is that beginning with the lowest score, which in this table is at the bottom, we have started adding up in another column, we've accumulated the frequencies. So each entry here is adding on the current line to the sum of all the previous lines until at the very top we see that there were a total of 50 scores, which is also the number we would get if we added up the total number of scores in the frequency column. This is just a quick learning check I encourage you to stop the video and figure out for yourself how many subjects were included in this frequency table and then come back and we'll talk about it. Often people answer this question with 15, which you get by summing up each of the scores, 5 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1. But these x values are the actual scores, not the number of people. The correct answer is going to be 10, the number that we get by adding up the frequency of each of the scores. So we get 2 plus 4 plus 1 plus 0 plus 3 equals 10. Every once in a while somebody multiplies the 2 and then adds things up and that's how you would get 32. It's also incorrect. The right number is the relative frequency or percentage table um, takes the information from the cumulative frequency and goes one step farther. The cumulative frequency is nice because it gives you the sum of numbers, but you don't really know what it is in a proportion. The relative frequency or the percentage lets you see not only how many there are accumulated up to that point, but what percentage it is of or what proportion of the total population. That lets you compare different tables and different groups. A grouped frequency table is one of the most common things that we see, especially when there's a large number of scores as we have in this original table. Rather than have to try to deal with so many categories, we'd rather have a smaller number of categories organized into equal intervals. In this case, the authors chose to use five-point intervals. And so we will see that they uh, broke the intervals at five points each and then added up the frequency inside each one. So for instance, the second category here, 90 to 94, um, has a frequency of 8, and that's 2 plus 1 plus 2 plus 1 plus 2, the number that we saw we can see in there.
One of the things to notice is that um, the table says it's organized with five point intervals, but many people, when they look at this, they do a subtraction and they'll say, hmm, 59 minus 55, that's not five points, that's four points. This is where our real limits come into play. If this is a continuum, the lower limit of 55 is really 54.5, and the upper limit of 59 is really 59.5. And if you subtract 54.5 from 59.5, you will in fact have a five-point interval. This slide just shows us the way a table is usually shown with the class marks um, naming the intervals and then filling in what the actual real intervals would be on the assumption that we're dealing with continuous data. So here's another learning check. If we had a grouped frequency distribution with the intervals as mentioned here, 0 to 9, 10 to 19, What's the width of the interval 20 to 29? If we were doing it just by subtraction, people would pick 9 points. But the correct answer is 10 points because of the real limits, as we've been talking about. There are a few conventions about graphs. One of them is to try to make the y-axis not as tall as the x-axis is long. If we're talking about bar graphs, we want to have about somewhere between 5 and 12 bars if possible. More than that is too hard to read and fewer than that is not worth making a graph about. The width of the intervals need to be equal and our frequency values need to be continuous on the y-axis. And in general we want not to stretch or compress the values on either of our two axes. Here are three examples of bar graphs that have problems. In the upper left, we see a bar graph where they've used 3D um, effects and they've done two things that are bad. Overall, the 3D effects tend to exaggerate the larger bars more than the small bars, and so it's not a good practice for any kind of bar graph. But when they have two layers of bars the way they do here, it makes the front group seem more prominent. In this situation, the pinkish bars actually represent the larger proportion. The frequencies were higher for every single one of these categories, but what we come away with is the idea that the blues outnumbered the pinks. In the lower left, we see a rocket shape version of a bar graph where they've put a gradient into each bar that draws your eye upward and it tends to accentuate the larger values of the larger frequencies and make the others seem diminished. The graph on the right has quite a few problems. The most important is that there are no labels for any of these bars, so we don't even know what's been graphed. But on top of that, we also see that for some reason the largest frequencies are on the two outside edges and that makes the other values seem much smaller. In a situation like this, unless there was some dimension that prevented it, it would be much better to put the two most frequent groups together. A pictograph is another form of a bar chart and in general there are many good pictographs. Unfortunately, this is not one of them. It has a variety of errors. We can see that each uh, picture is supposed to represent 10 children, and they were graphing the countries of origin of these different children. Well, there were fewer than 10 children who uh, came from Germany, so we have sort of a decapitated child. And the same is true for Vietnam. We've got a partial child for Puerto Rico, and for Russia we've got a decapitated child floating on some others. So all of that is not a good way to be having the graph. On top of it, it looks like the child from Italy was probably originally riding a scooter, but is now in just this pretty peculiar position. And worst of all, the child from China is the only one who is not playing and seems to be pulling a rickshaw. So there's 
two things that are wrong with that. One is that the child plus the rickshaw is twice as big as the Russian child or the Italian child, so it makes us think there are many more Chinese children just because the image is so big. And then on top of it, it is um, pretty much a racist category to have all the children playing except for one category that's working. So often people try to do something attractive or eye-catching, but it's important to be accurate and have someone else look over a graph to make sure you haven't fallen into one of these errors. Histograms are used to graph continuous data, and they're basically the same as a bar graph, except that the bars touch each other in order to indicate that the data are continuous. The graph that we're looking at here is a bad histogram. It has several problems. First, a um, curved horizontal axis was used, which means that we can't compare the heights of the bars directly. Then we also can see that the lowest categories of income, under $10,000, are on the right, and that the income categories increase as we move to the left, and the order should be the other way around. We also can see that the intervals are not equal. This graph, um, this first bar is under 10000 Then they go up in increments of about $10,000 each until we get to 50 to 75 and 75 and over. So even though the bars look like they're equal here, the actual interval is not equal. And then this bar here is just plain wrong. All of the others went up to $999, so $30,000 to $39,999. But in doing this, they left off the last $999, and you can see that there's a break in the pattern, and it's probably due to eliminating the cases of people who were earning between $49,000 and $49,999. So this is an actual error occurring in the graph. We often want to describe the shape of a curve or the shape of a distribution, and we're comparing to a normal curve more often than to anything else. A normal curve is symmetric, it, which means that the left-hand side and the right-hand side are mirror images of each other. If you remember, the height of the um, graph is telling us the frequency, so we can see that in a normal curve the greatest number of people are in the center and then smaller and smaller numbers until we get out to what's called the tail, which has very few people in those tails. When a graph is not symmetric, we say that it's skewed, and we name the skew by the direction of the extreme values, or the tail. So in a negative skew, most of the scores are positive with a few extreme scores down to the lower left side. A positive skew is just the opposite situation. Most of the scores are at the lower range, but there are a small number of positive scores. Sometimes it helps to have an example to think about these. A negative skew is what happens when a professor gives an exam that's too easy. If that happens, almost everybody gets a high score, and only a very small number of people will get a low score on the exam that was easier than the professor expected. The other possibility that can happen is a professor gives an exam that's much harder than she expected, and then most of the class gets a low score except for a small number who have high scores. The other example for a positive skew is to think about income. Often the majority of people have low to moderate incomes, and it's only when you get out to the Bill Gates range that you have the small number of extreme values. Symmetric and skewed distributions in general have just one mode, or peak point, but a curve can be bimodal or even multimodal with more than two modes or peak points. 
it's important to remember that a bimodal curve can be symmetric. The one in this example isn't. Um, the mode on the left has a higher frequency count than the one on the right. But as we'll see in some of the examples in central tendency, there are situations where a symmetric bimodal graph gives you the same result or the appearance of the same result as a symmetrical graph. So that's it for our tables and graphs. You're ready to go on to central tendency in module 5 of the textbook.